Hey class, welcome back to the History of Christianity. Uh, we're going to continue our look today at the different aspects of the Reformation. Uh, last time we looked at the Anabaptist movement, and today we're going to move into the English Reformation. As the Reformation was moving around Europe, uh, Henry VIII up in England had a conflict with the Pope because he wanted to have uh, a, a male heir, and he and his wife were having difficulty uh, having a male heir. And so Henry VIII wanted to uh, wanted to have a different wife, and so it caused a conflict with the Catholic Church, and Henry VIII um, changed a lot of things in England to where it, a, a Reformation takes place, and then the Reformation uh, ideals from the continent of Europe uh, migrate over into England. And so in the end of it, what happens is we have a new um, side of the church, which is called the Church of England, where the monarchy, in this case Henry VIII, is the head of the Church of England, and, and not the Pope, who is the, the head of the church uh, on mainland Europe. And uh, the head of the Church of England, which is the monarchy, is still there today. Uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, who is on the throne currently today in England, is the head of the Church of England. So we'll be looking at the different aspects of the English Reformation today. Stay tuned for the PowerPoint. Okay, class, here we go on our PowerPoint portion of this lecture for the English Reformation. And there's a painting there of uh, Henry VIII, that uh, large monarch of England. Okay, so to begin our, our look here of the English Reformation, we need to understand that uh, the English Reformation began with, um, with Henry VIII. And we have to understand his his basically his family tree because it's all kind of intertwined, especially when you get to his children. So we're going to uh, look here at this um, family tree that the internet has conveniently provided for me. And so we have it there on the screen. Henry the Seventh up there on the top top left. I'll put my arrow up there. Uh, this is um, uh, Henry the Seventh, or what we would say is Henry Tudor, and he starts the House of Tudor and the Tudor monarchy of. Of England, and this is a very uh, interesting time period. If you ever do any kind of study of the monarchs, uh, Henry, um, the House of Tudor was a very powerful house uh, in England because of basically who it was. You have Henry VIII, and then uh, his uh, um, his one daughter is uh, Bloody Mary, and what she did, even though she didn't reign very long, but then his other daughter Elizabeth I became a very very powerful queen and very powerful, a uh, uh, long long standing uh, monarch. Of, uh, of England during this time. But it's all intertwined within the English Reformation. So you have uh, Henry VII, or Henry Tudor up here. He's married to Elizabeth of York, and they ha have some children. They have Henry VIII, but actually they first here, over here, they have uh, Arthur Tudor, and then Henry VIII, and if you just go on off to the right of the screen, there's some others, but we're not worried about them. So, but all of these people here that I'm circling... All of these are involved with what takes place with the English Reformation. So um, we have uh, Catherine of Aragon, who was actually married to Arthur Tudor first, but he dies, and so then he gets she gets married to Henry VIII, and then through all the different thing issues that go on, uh, he gains other wives. So this union here produces Mary the First or Bloody Mary. And then we have Anne Boleyn produces Elizabeth I, and then we have Henry VIII with Jane Seymour and produces uh, Edward VI, and then we have next wife Anne of Cleves, and then Catherine Howard and Catherine Parr. So you see, there's just a lot of uh, a lot of wives of Henry VIII, and then his his three children uh, down here. So we're going to go through this. Uh, briefly, and, and look at the English Reformation, how it's intertwined with this family tree. So background to the English Reformation. At the start of the 16th century, England was an ally of Spain. And Henry VII, so that was that's Henry Tudor, the guy at the top of the family tree, he arranged the marriage of his son Arthur to Ar Catherine of Aragon, she was the 15-year-old daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain. So we know them, Ferdinand and Isabella. They're the ones that sent Columbus. So they arrange, Ferdinand and Isabella, and then Henry VII, Henry Tudor here, they arrange for these two to get married. 
Okay, so Catherine is the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, and they arrange, okay, we're going to have these two get married. Well, unfortunately, uh, four months later, Arthur dies. Okay, so Arthur right here, Arthur Tudor, he ends up dying. Spain and England wanted the alliance to succeed, so it was arranged that Catherine of Aragon would marry Arthur's brother, Henry VIII. So with, with Arthur, you know, he's dead. And so Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII, that uh, marriage is arranged. This, this marriage between Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII would require a papal bull since canon law prevented a man from marrying his dead brother's wife. And so they basically they would have to have, you know, Spain is very Catholic. Uh, England is Catholic at this time. And so they would need the Pope to basically say, okay, th this uh, son of Henry VII, who is Henry VIII, he, he needs uh, a papal bull to marry the daughter of the king and queen of Spain. Okay, so we have uh, the Pope needs to be involved. Well, the Pope ends up granting this marriage, and so Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon are married. So let's look at Henry VIII, 1491 to 1547, and his reign was from 1509 to 1547, so quite a long reign. And there's a pretty famous painting of the painting is very big, uh, but this is just the, his, uh, his head. But pretty famous uh, painting, and that's what you think of when you think of Henry VIII. But troubles brew. Now, this first marriage, it, it was not a happy one. Uh, first off, uh, they produced no male heir uh, from this marriage, and that was a big deal to Henry VIII. I mean, he was, like, consumed with producing uh, a male heir. That's all he basically wanted, but this marriage did not produce it. It, and they only had one child, and that was Mary Tudor, who we are going to see here in a few minutes, uh, Mary Tudor. So because they weren't having a, a boy, uh, Henry wants a divorce. He wants to um, ditch Catherine of Aragon, and so um, he has to get this through the Pope. Well, Pope Clement VII, he refuses. He says, nope, you're not, you're not getting a divorce. There's no reason for this. So what happens is the focus becomes, was it in the Pope's power to overturn the canon law for the marriage to proceed in the first place? So was it even in the, was it in the Pope's power? So that's where it starts being questioned. And if they, they give the answer of no, it is not, then basically that marriage can go away. Uh, Henry VIII and his supporters began to say that the Pope did not have the authority and the marriage was not a true one. Well, Thomas Cranmer... And that's him on the right, Thomas Cranmer. We're going to see him in a few minutes also. Uh, Thomas Cranmer is Henry VIII's religious advisor. And he went and got opinions of the leading Catholic universities in Paris and Oxford and Cambridge. And he's getting the opinions from these universities. I mean, this is where the doctrine is going to be debated. This is where the doctrine is going to be developed. And so let's go to the universities. Well, these universities said that the marriage was not valid, that the Pope did not have the authority to do this. So the Pope, he, he rejects this. He rejects what the universities say. Henry VIII had already petitioned for the divorce. He, he rejects Henry VIII's petition. He rejects all of this. And so now we have Henry VIII against the Pope. So what happens? We have escalation and a break uh, from the Catholic Church. At first, Henry VIII was never out to a reforming movement in England. Okay, so he, when we think about the English Reformation, don't think that Henry VIII was like jumping on the Reformation bandwagon and he was just all excited to change all kinds of things in the church. He was never out to do that. He just wanted to get rid of his first wife. But what happens is, and, and on this uh, PowerPoint, you see the second bullet point. Uh, in fact, the Pope actually had called Henry VIII the defender of the faith. I mean, so the Pope at one time looked at Henry VIII as a, a strong Catholic ally and a defender of the faith. However, as distance grew between Henry VIII and the Pope, um, th so there's this distance growing, Henry wanted to restore the king's rights in his lands and shed papal intervention. So Henry, with this, with this distance growing between the Pope and the problem with this marriage, Henry is like, you know what, I'm the king here, I should be in control of my land, and this Pope, he can take a hike and, and shed the papal intervention. 
in England. So in 1534, the final break occurs. Uh, the English Parliament enacted laws that forbidden payments to Rome. They ruled Henry VIII's marriage was not a true marriage, so he can get rid of his first wife now. Um, which also means that Mary, if that's the case, then the Parliament viewed that Mary was not the heir to the throne. So that only child that they had, Mary, Tudor, she's not the heir to the throne because that marriage was not a true marriage. Uh, Henry VIII is then also deemed, quote, and this is his title, the supreme head of the Church of England. And so the church within England separates from the Catholic Church and becomes the Church of England, and Henry VIII is the supreme head of the church. So now that he's in charge of the Church of England, he does set out to do some reforms. He aligns with the theological positions of the Catholic Church, However, most laws dealing with religion were more for political reasons over theological reformation. So what that means is uh, he basically believed what the Catholic Church believed. The beginning part of the Church of England, the beginning time, it, was, it looked basically like the Catholic Church in England, but instead of the Pope in charge, it's Henry VIII in charge. And if there was any kind of reforming movement or re reforming law change in the Church of England, it was more for a political reason than actually changing some, some something because it's theologically different or or whatever. They um, it was more for po political reasons. He was Henry VIII was a politician, not so much a theologian. Uh, number two, as soon as he was head of the Church of England, he goes on and absolves his marriage with Catherine of Aragon. And so the reason I put that in there is, as part of his reforms, is he is going to have several wives coming up. He has six in total. So as the head of the Church of England, uh, part of his reforms, that especially that he practiced, was if he's in charge of the church, then he can, uh, he can get rid of his wives. Uh, number three, 1536 to 1541, is this event called the Dissolution of... Uh, a dissolution of the monasteries uh, in England. And that's the actual title of it, Dissolution of the Monasteries. This takes place in uh, five years where almost all of the 625 monasteries that were in England were dissolved. So the orders are gone. The, monk, the uh, monastic orders are gone. Uh, most of the buildings themselves were destroyed and uh, all of the wealth in the land went to the king. And so that's a, that's a large number of monasteries that Henry VIII gets rid of. And we have a picture coming up of one of them. Uh, number four, uh, Cram Cranmer had the Bible translated, and Henry VIII made a decree that an English Bible would be in every single church. And so, that, I mean, that's good. The Bible is in the people's hands, and the Bible is in English. So... Henry VIII uh, had it put in the people's, uh, in, in their church. And it basically allowed for the Reformation movement to spread in England. So now that there's somebody that has split from the Catholic Church in charge of England, the reformers on the continent, those in Germany and in, in France and Italy and Switzerland and all, all those reformers, um, they now uh, spread into England. They're bringing their Reformation ideas into England. Uh, here's a picture of a monastery that's still there today. You can see these two people down here on the bottom right. You know, these are you know, this is a picture of today, and they're tourists or something going through. Uh, this is the ruins of St. Mary's Abbey in York, England, and you can go there today and see that. It was founded in 1155, and it was destroyed in 1539. And so this is the the remnants of it. It's been like that since 1539, so over um, you know, almost uh, almost 600 years now. Uh, that it's been like this, um, and it's probably a tourist tourist attraction. Now you can go there and take pictures and see the ruins. Okay, so we we can't uh, continue on here until we talk about Henry VIII's wives, because upcoming issues in the English Reformation are going to deal with the children uh, that were produced from these unions. So these are the the six wives of Henry VIII, uh, Catherine of Aragon. Uh, that's the first wife, and she was divorced, and they had a daughter, uh, Mary Tudor, who her nickname is Bloody Mary. Uh, the next one is Anne Boleyn. This is Henry VIII's second wife, Anne Boleyn, right here. 
Uh, she ends up being accused of adultery and beheaded in the Tower of London, while this union produced a daughter, uh, Elizabeth I. Then we have uh, Jane Seymour. Uh, Jane Seymour, uh, she dies uh, 12 days after giving birth, and um, finally from this union with Jane Seymour, a son is produced and an heir is produced, and that is Edward VI. Okay, so Jane Seymour gives Henry VIII a son, but she ends up dying 12 days later, but he has a son. So after Seymour dies, um, he marries Anne of Cleves, and she ends up being divorced. And then he marries Catherine Howard. Uh, she is accused of adultery and beheaded in the Tower of London. And then he marries Catherine Parr, who is widowed when Henry VIII dies. Okay, so these are the wives of Henry VIII. And the children, Mary Tudor, Elizabeth I, Edward VI. Okay, and so here's a fun poem, if you like poems. Uh, here we go. King Henry VIII, to six wives he was wedded. One died, one survived, two divorced, two beheaded. Okay, so there's a way you can remember it. Uh, but here's some pictures of, um, of his wives, Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. Okay, so those are the six wives of Henry VIII and the, what happened to them up here in the poem. Okay, so we are going to continue now our look at the English Reformation through the Tudor line. Henry VIII ends up having finally having a male heir, and his name is Edward VI. Born in 1537 and died in 1553, his reign was 1547 to 1553. So he was very young, okay? Uh, Henry VIII died in 1547, and his son Edward VI became king. Now, Parliament had agreed that Edward would become king, and then Mary would become queen, and Elizabeth would then become queen in birth order. Okay, And no one thought that Edward VI reign would be so short. He came to the throne at nine years old. And he was a very sickly child, and so he, he and he he ends up dying young. And um, his early years, he had two regencies uh, that helped him rule. So we're going to look at these two regencies. First off, Edward the Sixth and the Duke of Somerset Regency. Now, during this time, it was a time of great advance for the reformers. Henry the Eighth lived for quite some time, separated from the Catholic Church, and he's the head of the Church of England. And now his young boy, Edward VI, is in charge, and the Reformers are just spreading around through, throughout England. Well, under the Duke of Somerset's um, regency, uh, there's some reforms that take place. First off, the laity could partake of the cup, so the people could eat the bread and drink the cup in communion. Uh, the clergy could marry. Uh, images were taken out of churches. And so right there you're seeing that they're just going completely against, just changing things to go against the Catholic Church. Uh, the Book of Common Prayer was produced, and this is the first edition because there's going to be future editions with a, a pretty serious change in each one. That's why I have that note number one it highlighted in red. Uh, the main author was Cranmer. Okay, so uh, we, we saw a picture of him earlier. Uh, we'll see him coming up also with Mary uh, Tudor or Bloody Mary. Uh, but the main um, author of the Book of Common Prayer was Cranmer. Uh, this guy here, this is, the, this is the Duke of Somerset, this picture here. Okay. Um, but back to, the, back to the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, the liturgy was in the English language for the first time. So this book had liturgical writings in it, the, and the priests in the Church of England would read the liturgy. But now it is, it is written in English so the people can understand it. And then I have a note number one. In the Book of Common Prayer regarding the Lord's Supper, it states in a very Catholic way, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. 
Okay, so that was said during the uh, during the mass, during the the taking of the of the bread and wine, and is very Catholic with what I just said. Okay, but that's going to change. It's going to change under this guy, the Duke of Northumberland, and he's there on the right. So this is going to be the second regency of Edward the Sixth. Uh, when I say regency, uh, I don't know if you know what that means, but basically it means there's somebody else kind of uh, advising this young king, Edward VI, advising him on policy. And so the Duke of Northumberland takes over after the Duke of Somerset. And under Northumberland, uh, more reforming activity takes place, and actually with more zeal. So it's really spreading around. And he's influenced by Zwinglian ideals. So um, we have reforming ideals, not just from the continent, but from, from Switzerland, you know, down there in that hotbed of Reformation. And Zwingli ideals are coming into England. And under this regency, the Book of Common Prayer, the second edition, is produced. It's reissued. But there's some changes. Now, listen to this way the Lord's Supper is uh, described. Note number two. Regarding, regarding the Lord's Supper, it states in a very Protestant way. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee, and feed on him in thy heart by faith and thanksgiving. Okay, so that's very Protestant and very different from note number one, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Okay, so very, very Protestant now. Uh, this small shift reveals that the Reformation was transforming England theologically. So really starting to kind of push away from the Catholic Church and Catholic doctrine. And the Reformers are, are changing things. The Reformers had high hopes for their movement. But unfortunately, Edward VI dies as a boy. And Mary Tudor, she lived 1516 to 1558. Her reign was 1553 to 1558. Uh, she comes onto the throne and things turn completely opposite for the reformers. Edward VI died in 1553 at the age of 15. And according to the line of succession, Mary Tudor was the next queen. Now she is the daughter of Henry VIII and his first marriage, Catherine of Aragon. Because of what took place with her father, the divorce debacle of Henry VIII, his split from the Pope, she began. Uh, she was declared an illegitimate child. And so because of these three things, the divorce, the split, and the illegitimate child declaration, Mary, she became a staunch Catholic. She, didn't, she went right back to the Catholic Church. And she rejected her father's and half-brothers, that's Edward VI, uh, his their reforms. She rejected the Protestant reforms, and and took the country right back to Catholicism. Out of this conviction, and also obviously some political reasoning, there's they're never separate from politics. Mary was bent on making England Catholic again. So what she does is she consolidates her position by taking a husband. She marries the very Catholic. Philip of Spain, who would later become Philip II. So we have um, we have Mary Tudor, who is turning the country back to Catholicism, and she marries a very Catholic husband, Philip of Spain. So what does she do? Mary Tudor's anti-Reformation reforms. She increases suppression and persecution of Protestants. So the Protestants have moved in, and they're really, really taking hold. I mean, after all, under Henry VIII, all the monasteries have been destroyed. So she's, she's putting all this back. And in 1554, England officially returns to the obedience to the Pope. So there's no more split between England and the Pope. She reinstates the feast days that the Catholic Church followed. She told all the married clergy. So remember, we for, for many years now, since Henry VIII split and all of the changes that take place um, from the English Reformation, one of them, the clergy could get married. Well, now you have these married clergy, and Mary Tudor tells these people, these married clergy members, by royal decree to set their wives aside. So that's not going to fly too well, um, especially with the wives, but set, set the wives aside. 
aside. And then royal policy to persecute Protestant leaders is enacted. Basically, if any Protestant was captured or a leader was captured, they were ordered to recant. If they refused, they were killed. And so Mary Tudor became known with the nickname Bloody Mary. And so uh, one of the interesting things that we have, and there's copies of this in the library, or you can just buy it online. I have a copy on my bookshelf, uh, is John Fox's Book of Martyrs. And in there it talks a lot about martyrdom, but John Fox lived during this time, and he um, was actually recording the martyrdoms of Christians on the European continent when, when uh, Mary Tudor takes the throne. And so when the persecutions and martyrdoms increase uh, there in England, uh, he begins to record these martyrdoms under Bloody Mary. Now what happens is the book's impact strengthened the Protestant movement. So if you've ever if you've ever read John Fox's Book of Martyrs or or whatever, um, you may just look at it as stories of the past and some how these people were killed, but really it made a big impact on the movement. And it's because in the in the original um, a book, the Book of Martyrs, there were woodcuts made, and these woodcuts are basically pictures carved on a wood block of a scene of the person being martyred, and then they would put ink on the block and stamp it onto a piece of paper for the book, and you would have a picture in the book of a martyrdom scene. And so the people would read Book of Martyrs and see these pictures. Now, these pictures were actually used to educate uh, children. And later, the Puritans definitely would use them to bolster this long-lasting animosity between the Puritans uh, and the Catholics. And we'll, we'll talk about the Puritans later, but uh, it just shows that this book did have an impact. It's more than just stories. It had an impact uh, on the actual movement, the, the Reformation movement in England. And furthermore, it, it really solidified and strengthened the Protestant movement. And that's a picture of John Fox there on the right. So I just want to give you an example. Uh, this is right from the Book of Martyrs, Reverend John Bland, Reverend John Frankish, Nicholas Shetterton, and Humphrey Middleton. These Christian persons were all burnt at Canterbury for the same cause. Frankish and Bland were ministers and preachers of the Word of God, the one being Parson of Adisham and the other Vicar of Rol Rolvenden. Mr. Bland was cited to answer for his opposition to anti-Christianism, which means basically anti-Catholic, and underwent several examinations before Dr. Harpsfield, Archdeacon of Canterbury, and finally on the 25th of June, 1555, again withstanding the power of the Pope, he was condemned and delivered to the secular arm. On the same day were condemned John Frankish, Nicholas Shetterton, Humphrey Middleton, Thacker, and Crocker, of whom Thacker only recanted. Being delivered to the secular power, Mr. Bland, with the three former, were all burnt together at Canterbury, July 12, 1555, at two several at two several stakes, but it, in, but in one fire, when they, in the sight of God and His angels and before men, like true soldiers of Jesus Christ, gave a constant testimony to the truth of His holy gospel. So we have a, a example there of these men being burned at the stake in Canterbury for refusing to recant when they spoke against the Catholic Church. This is a very short description. If you look at the Fox Book of Martyrs, most of them are quite long or longer than this, and it gives more detail of what, what took place, especially with, um, uh, with going back and forth with the authorities, the, secular, the religious arm and the secular arm. So sometimes the stories are longer, but uh, this is a good example of uh, one of the entries of John Fox's Book of Martyrs. The Martyrdom of Thomas Cranmer. So uh, he was, we, already, we saw the picture of him earlier, but he was Archbishop of Canterbury, which is the highest position in England. Now, that position um, was Catholic, and then it became Protestant, and now it's back to Catholic. And so he refused Catholicism, and he would not recant. So what happens is Mary Tudor sends his case to Rome. You know, she's, she's Catholic, and she wants to make sure this is all done right, so she sends the case to Rome. Uh, they end up condemning him as a heretic, so Cranmer's now a heretic. They actually burned him in effigy, which means they made a um, combustible 
um, full size body of Cranmer out of out of straw and clothing and all of that, and then they burned it. So they burned his um, his effigy in Rome because he's back in England. Uh, but really, what that means is that he's been condemned. So Mary wants to take him and she wants him killed. Uh, but first. She wants him to uh, publicly recant for maximum humiliation in front of uh, the, the people. Well, he still refuses. He's not going to recant. Well, Mary forces Cranmer to watch two of his associates that he had uh, executed. And these two guys' names are Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. And now I've done, I've done quite a bit of study on Hugh Latimer. I wrote a paper on Hugh Latimer and the preaching of Hugh Latimer uh, for one of my PhD seminars, and it's a very interesting um, uh, life and how he's involved in the Reformation. Just a real quick little side note: I uh, remember Edward the Sixth, who we just talked about, the boy king. Um, he he thought it was entertaining to have. Uh, people come in and preach to his royal court. So he would sit on the throne and he'd have his royal court around him on, on chairs and he would bring in English reformers and have them preach. Well, uh, Hugh Latimer was one of those uh, preachers. And so uh, we think about uh, kings and all of that doing um, for entertainment, having a court jester or doing other activities for entertainment. Well, Henry the Sixth, who again, he died at 15 years old, uh, he enjoyed having people preach. And so Hugh Latimer came in and he would preach to the court under Henry the Sixth. But anyway, uh, now we're back to Mary Tudor, or Bloody Mary, and she ends up having Hugh Latimer killed and Nicholas Ridley killed, and she forces Cranmer to watch these two guys uh, be executed. And then right after that, uh, he ends up being burned at the stake. And here's, a, a, again, another picture of um, Cranmer uh, being burned at the stake. So he's, he's here like waving his arms around and, and all that. The story is, is that, he and, that Mary Tudor wanted him to recant and he was tortured. And so he signed a certificate that, that said he recanted. And then later withdrew it. And when he withdrew it and they said, okay, you're now going to be burned at the stake. He said that he was going to have his hand burned first because he used his hand to sign the, the recantation paper. And so in this picture, you see his hand is in the flames. And so that's a, um imagery that he burned his hand first. But he ends up dying uh, at the stake. Okay, well, uh, Mary Tudor is not going to uh, last too long. Her reign is kind of short, and it was very bloody. And when she dies, Elizabeth I uh, takes over. She was born in 1533 and died in 1603. Her reign was from 1558 to 1603, so again, a very long reign, uh, just shy of 50 years. And there's a picture of her. She was known as the Virgin Queen because uh, she did not have any children. She was not married. She never married. And she had no children. So Mary Tudor, or Bloody Mary, dies in 1558, and Elizabeth comes to power. Now she is the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, which was Henry VIII's second marriage. Well, Elizabeth I is complete opposite of her half sister. Uh, she is Protestant, and so she goes and flips the country back to Protestantism but not in such a radical way. Uh, Pope Paul IV said he would recognize Elizabeth as legitimate heir if she would continue allowing the Catholic Mass in England. So again, Mary Tudor put the country back to being Catholic, and the Mass was being done in the country. Well, Elizabeth I uh, refuses this. It's like, no, we're not doing that. Um, she undid Bloody Mary's Catholic initiatives, Reformers who had fled from England under Bloody Mary, they, they are now coming back from the continent, and they're bringing more Reformation ideas with them, especially Zwinglian and obviously Calvinistic ideas. They're, they're being brought back into, uh, into England, which is now Protestant again. But like I said, she rules England with a little bit more religious tolerance. She wanted the... Uh, the nation, uh, she wanted the country of England to be a united kingdom. 
and united in a common worship of God. And so what she did was she did allow different theological opinions. Uh, it was Protestant, but she allowed different opinions. But she did reject any religious extremism. And so one way that she wanted to bring in kind of the more tolerance was the third edition of the Book of Common Prayer. And again, remember back to note number one and number two that were highlighted in red a few minutes ago. Well, note number three, this is in the edition under Elizabeth I. Regarding the Lord's Supper, stated in a very Protestant and Catholic way, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. That's Catholic. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee and feed on him in thy heart by faith and thanksgiving. So that's Protestant. So she kind of had it crammed together to basically bring in everybody into the fold under her religious tolerance in, in England. Okay, so now we have also what was written in 1562 is called the 39 Articles. Now, the 39 Articles, again, Elizabeth I is now the head of the Church of England. It's the doctrinal foundation of the Church of England. So this is going to lay out the doctrine for the Church of England. Um, under Henry VIII, the Church of England looked very Catholic. Then it went Protestant, and then it went back to Catholic, and now it's Protestant again. And so what happens is the 39 Articles uh, gets rid of some Catholic doctrine right away, just rejects it outright. Uh, but there was definitely an ecumenical tone to the 39 Articles. So it's kind of like we'll get rid of some doctrine, but others we will uh, kind of either change a little bit or just say it in a different way and still remain, uh, hold some kind of a Catholic, um, Catholic theology to it. So the Catholics, uh, they were allowed to remain in England. It, they, they remained in England in a precarious way. Uh, they couldn't do anything against the queen, but uh, they were still there worshiping in their, their Catholic way, as long as they didn't cause any big issues. But under Elizabeth, we, got, we also have to remember that Bloody Mary wasn't the only one that, that did any kind of persecution. Um, under Elizabeth, there was still persecution, especially of Catholics, um, but it was, um, it was less per year, I'll say it like that, because Elizabeth's reign had about the same number of executions as Bloody Mary's reign. It's just that Elizabeth's reign was, was five times as long. Uh, so Bloody Mary was a, a short reign with a lot of deaths, and Elizabeth's was a long reign with kind of like the same number of deaths. So there were still executions uh, that take place under Elizabeth I. Uh, Catholics in England decide what we're going to do is they're going to distinguish obedience to the Pope and to the Queen. And so what that means is it's kind of like separation of church and state. Uh, they looked at the Queen as the, as the ruler of the land, like the state ruler, because they, they, didn't, they weren't part of the Church of England, so they didn't look at her as the, as the head of the church. Uh, they looked at her as the head of the country. And so they would be obedient to her, but religiously they would be obedient to the Pope. And so it's kind of like a separation of church and state is what the Catholics kind of solidified into. And they were allowed to remain in England and worship as long as they were obedient to the Queen. And what happens is uh, later on, we'll, we will talk about them a little bit you know, later on, but the Puritans who are motivated by Calvinism that came over from the continent uh, they start seeing problems within the Church of England, which Elizabeth I is the head of. And they want to purify the Church of England. That's where we get their name, Puritans, the Church of England, and get it back closer to what the New Testament is saying. Because, again, the, the uh, Church of England it, it still you know, it, it had its own problems, too, and the Puritans wanted to purify it. And that's it for this PowerPoint. I'll see you in a second. Okay, class, that's it for the uh, English Reformation. Next time, we're going to look at the final aspect of the Reformation that we'll be examining, and that is called the Counter-Reformation. And that's where, basically, the Catholic Church finally sees that it needs to kind of brush itself up and clean itself up from, from within, and we'll look at some different uh, activities that the Catholic Church did uh, within itself to uh, basically try to reform itself. So we'll look at that next time. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.